But anyway, it's my great pleasure to have Steve here at Google. Steve is an author, business columnist, and behavioral expert, and co-author of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Business Week International bestseller, Yes, 50 Scientifically Proven Ways to Be Persuasive, which to date has sold over half a million copies and has been translated into 26 languages. Steve's current book, The Small Big, has been published worldwide this month and is available on Amazon. Steve speaks about the science of influence and persuasion and its application to a wi wide variety of business, government, and nonprofit organizations around the world. As well as an extensive list of corporate clients, Steve has worked with the UK Cabinet Office and the Behavioral Change Network team at the UK Department of Health. He's guest lecturer on senior executive programs at the London Business School, CAS Business School, Oxford, is it Said? Said? Said Business School, and the Judge Business School. University of Cambridge, UK. Steve regularly features in the media, national press, and online, including MSNBC, BBC TV, and radio. Uh, and radio, the New York Times, and Wired Magazine. His monthly columns, including the Persuasion column in the British Airways in-flight magazine, and columns for the Harvard Business Review are read by over 2.5 million people every month. So please, um, you know, a round of applause and join me in welcoming Steve to Google. Well, thank you very much indeed, Marius. It's an absolute delight. I'm just so happy to be here and uh, uh, talk to a full room here at Google this afternoon about a subject which I hope you'll find not only well, super interesting, but also relevant to your roles. One of the things I'd like to be able to do this afternoon is not just talk about the theory of persuasion science, but talk about the practice of influence and persuasion as well. And specifically how sometimes just making very small changes to the way that you make a case or present a proposal or uh, request of someone can oftentimes lead to very big differences in your persuasive success. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that and uh, clearly keyed to uh, our new book, uh, The Small Big. But I thought I'd start out actually by telling you a story. I, I love this story. It concerns uh, the late Lord Grade of Elstree, um, a British uh, peer who tells the story or used to tell the story of a, a young man who came to his office one day seeking employment. Um, the story goes that uh, Lord Lou would be sitting at his desk, smoking uh, his fifth Havana of the day. It was, after all, around 7.30 in the morning. And he, for a few moments, stared menacingly at this young man who was sitting the opposite side of the desk, um, before standing up and placing on the desk between them a large jug of water and then he looked at this young man and he said, young man, I've been told that you're quite the persuader. So sell me this jug of water. Undaunted, this young man got up. He went to the corner of the room where there was a waste paper basket full to brimming. He picked it up and brought it back to the desk and placed it next to the jug of water and then lit a match dropped it <laughs> into the waste paper basket and waited for a few moments until the flames had reached uh, an impressive and perhaps rather anxiety-inducing level, and then turned round and said to the peer, is his lordship interested in buying a jug of water? <laughs> now, the story is entertaining, but I think it's also instructive when we think about influence and persuasion because there are many approaches that that young man could have taken to convince his counterpart. He could have, for example, provided some information or tried to uh, sell this jug of water by considering the features and the benefits of the jug of water. He could have used an economic argument and thought about how he might provide some monetary incentive or motivation in order to persuade his audience. But instead what he did was pull on another lever of the influence process, not the informational motivation, not the economic motivation, but a change in context, an environmental motivation, that small shift which incidentally, if you think about it, did nothing to change what was on offer. He simply made that small shift in environment that led 
to that change in behavior. And that's the case that I'd like to make when it comes to influence and persuasion, particularly successful influence and persuasion. Increasingly, in this information overloaded world that we actually live in, what we're finding now, particularly these last two decades of persuasion science, is that contexts will frequently trump cognitions when it comes to successful influence and persuasion. And sometimes all that requires you to do as a communicator is to make very small, often subtle changes to the way that you make a proposition or proposal that link to deep-seated motivations inherent in all of us. In fact, one of the things that this body of research suggests is something rather surprising. It's this idea that whilst there may be many tens of thousands of different ways in which we can successfully influence and persuade others through the use of tactics or changes, the vast majority of most successful influence and persuasion can be categorized in terms of just three core motivations. Those core motivations are that in this increasingly information overloaded world, we want to make quick and efficient decisions. We want to also make decisions in ways that affiliate us with others and gain the approval of others. And finally, we want to make decisions and behave in ways that allow us to be seen in the best possible and positive light. So the claim that I have here, and the claim that we make in this book, is by thinking about influence in the context of these three core motivations and aligning your request or your strategy or your proposal or proposition to one or more of these can significantly enhance your success. So I want to give you a few examples and then uh, after we've done that we'll talk a little bit about how we can apply these and maybe take a few questions. So let's talk about the first, this inherent motivation we have to make accurate decisions as efficiently and as quickly as we possibly can. What's kind of interesting about this is that oftentimes we won't even consider what is on offer in order to do that. Instead what we do is consider something, uh, an alternative, a comparison. Uh, let me give you an example. How many of you like a glass of wine, maybe in the evenings or a, a weekends? There's a fair few number of you, is it? Okay. Um, so consider the humble wine list. Um, typically when a, a, a restaurant or a hotel bar uh, presents its wines to its customers, it does so in this way. It starts with a house wine at the top, and as you see, as you look down the list, the wine increases in price. It's uh, familiar to you. Um, and typically what we find is, is that when people are presented with offers in this way, they typically pick those items towards the top, not the cheapest. No one wants to be a cheapskate after all. So they'll pick the second or third wines on the list. Okay? There's a small change that any wine bar, any hotel, any restaurant can make that significantly alters the choices that people make. And it doesn't require them to delete options. It doesn't require them to invest in costly resources or incentivize these cho choices. It simply requires them to turn the list upside down. And in that instance, these now become more popular. This is a really good example, I think, of not only a small change that leads to a big difference in this instance, but also this idea of how we use one stimulus, one proposition, to make an accurate and efficient decision about what that right course of action is next. Okay? Um, now, it turns out there's a restaurant chain in Europe that have taken this uh, one stage further. Um, and what they've found is, is that sometimes you don't have to make uh, what you compare something to the same. Um, what's interesting about the Carluccio's restaurant, down here on the um, bottom left-hand side, um, the first thing when you open a Carluccio's menu that you see is a motor scooter. Um, as you'll see, it's uh, priced here at £2,771. That's about $3,500. Uh, there it is there. Um, why would a restaurant sell a motor scooter or attempt to sell a motor scooter on its menu? Well, it turns out that it uh, sure as hell makes their salads and sandwiches appear a lot cheaper. Um, and that's the point that we're making here. Oftentimes, you can change people's perception of the proposition you make, change people's reaction to your proposal, not by doing anything to change your proposal at all, but instead by thinking carefully about how you might compare 
something less favorable first, uh, a different option, knowing that in this information overloaded world where we seek to make quick and efficient decisions, that's a small change you can make that leads to a big difference. But here's a mistake that we often make. You know, when we're presenting proposals, when we're thinking about how we might craft our case, we'll come up with lots of different options that we're about to present and then discard those that are perhaps not the optimum. And we'll focus on just one option and throw away those options that uh, perhaps aren't optimal. And it turns out that that can be a mistake. Uh, in the same way as when you were at school, you'd get extra marks for showing not only how you got to the math answer, but how you actually, uh, not just the answer itself, but how you actually got to the answer. The same is true of influence and persuasion. Anything you can do in the early stages of your propositions, your proposals, to point out options that you are going to discard increases the salience and the attractiveness of the very next thing that you actually present. Okay. Works in negotiations too, so a wonderful set of studies here um, that simply show that going first in a negotiation tends to be the optimum thing to do. Uh, we have lots of questions sometimes from people that say, well, if I'm going to go into a negotiation, is it better for me to sit back and wait for that uh, opponent to make, make their first offer? Uh, or is it better actually if I make uh, the first offer myself? And the, the answer is clearly the latter. In these studies, for example, uh, the negotiators purchasing quite uh, large-scale industrial units here we find that those buyers that presented their option, their price first, typically came away with about a $5 million increased value compared to those that actually uh, waited for the opponent to make the first offer. So there's a, there's a key thing here, a key theme rather here about this idea of what you present first matters an awful lot when it comes to influence and persuasion. Let's talk about the second of these motivations, our desire to affiliate with others, to make decisions and behave in ways that gain the approval of others. Um, before we talk about some of the examples from persuasion science, I think it's important at this point to mention a dark side, a downside to this idea of affiliating and behaving in the way that others do. Um, one of the things we know from extensive research on this idea of social norms, that people follow what many others are doing, is that it doesn't discriminate between desirable and undesirable behaviors. Uh, if we see that many people are behaving in ways that are undesirable, are less productive to the organization, um, uh, we can often join them and we can often find that those unwanted behaviors uh, increase further. Uh, There's a really good example from here in the United States. In 2007, the Inland Revenue Services doubled the fine for the late submission of taxes from $100 to $200. And the reason that the IRS gave for that doubling of the fine was because the previous year, so many American citizens had failed to submit their tax returns on time. So in an attempt to motivate people to submit their tax returns on time, they doubled the fine. The next year, there was a 22% increase in late submissions. It's almost as if people are saying, well, if everyone else is doing it, then maybe I should do it too. And this is an important consideration when you think about trying to change behaviors, particularly less desirable behaviors in organizations and in societies. You know, often leaders will make the mistake of drawing attention to regrettably frequent undesirable behaviors and in doing so, actually serve to increase their frequency. Um, Just say no to drugs. <laughs> There's a, one of my favorite examples concerns uh, the National Petrified Forest Park in Arizona here in the United States. Uh, visitors would uh, come up to uh, the gate um, and they would see a sign uh, designed to reduce the theft of petrified wood and crystals from the forest floor that they were losing some 14 tons of per year. And the sign would say, your heritage is being lost, vandalized, if you like, by the theft of small pieces of crystal and petrified wood. Last year, we lost 14 tons. People were coming up to the gate, looking at the sign and thinking, we better get ours quick then. <laughs> you know, it wasn't a crime prevention strategy. It was a crime promotion strategy. You know? So, so much better 
if you want to influence and persuade effectively using this core motivation to point to behaviors that are desirable in a given situation. Now, uh, my two co-authors, Noah Goldstein and uh, Robert Cialdini, gained some notoriety a few years ago for a set of studies concerning these small cards that you'll often find in hotel bathrooms. Have you seen these? This card here, this is from the one from the hotel that uh, we're staying at this weekend. Help us save the planet. It's time for us to take part in helping out the environment. Please reuse your towels by hanging them on the rack as a signal that you want to play your part for the environment. Turns out there's a much, much more effective way of getting people to reuse their towels and linens, um, which concerns changing the words on this card to instead of saying, please do it for the sake of the environment, to instead say, did you know that significant numbers of people who stay in our hotel do reuse their towels and linens. That simple message of affiliating and aligning the message to gain the approval of others typically increases towel reuse by about 26%. That's a pretty big difference for such a small change. Now, consider this for a few moments. If you were to check into a hotel and see one of those little cards in the bathroom, and it said the following message. I'd just consider for a few moments what your first reaction would be if when you picked up the card you read a message that said, Dear guest, did you know that the person that stayed in this room before you reused their towels and linens? Yeah, that's exactly what you, The first thing you're going to think is, I hope they're not the same towels, <laughs> you know? No one wants to know what the person who stayed in that hotel room before you got up to or did. As far as we're concerned, we're the first person to have ever stayed in that room. And so interestingly, people will typically dismiss that message, that persuasive appeal, as having no relevance at all. It will have no effect. But interestingly, in Noah and Bob's studies, when they change that message to say, dear guest, the majority of people that stayed in this room, 107, 416, 921, reused their towel. It was the single most effective message of all, which demonstrates a really interesting quirk in terms of persuasion science. This idea that we're oftentimes not that good at actually recognizing what does influence and persuade us. And to give a demonstration, those towel studies spawned a subsequent set of research that uh, we were engaged in when it came to persuading people to pay their taxes on time. Take a look at this. The UK government typically would send out letters saying, please submit your tax return by this date, pay this amount. Um, if you fail to do so by the uh, scheduled date on this letter, there will be a fine. The fine is £100, is about $160. And they typically would get a response rate here, if you can see, about 68% uh, within a given time. We made one small change to that letter by placing a sentence across the top that simply said, truthfully, <coughs> that the majority of people do pay their taxes on time. And when we did that, we registered a pretty impressive increase in response rates. Okay? We didn't stop there. We went one stage further and said, well, if people are more likely to reuse their towels if they know that the person that stayed in the room before them reused their towels, would people be even more likely to respond to the uh, request to submit their tax returns on time if they're told not what the majority of people in the UK are doing, but the majority of people in their zip code, in their postal code? And the answer was yes. A further impressive increase. And when we add the name of the town, Mountain View, San Francisco, Tempe, Arizona, and key into that social identity, we get a huge increase. That's an 83% response rate. If you needed any more convincing of the power of these small changes linked to these deep-seated motivations, this is the set of data to provide that clarity, that um, evidence. Because the Inland Revenue Services in the United Kingdom have collected literally hundreds of millions of additional dollars in tax revenues by simply aligning their message, their persuasive appeal to this core motivation. Okay. 
talk about the final one, this idea that we want to act in ways that allow us to see ourselves in a positive light. It's why the majority of people think that they're an above average driver. It's also the reason why, you know, after our sports team has perhaps played particularly badly one weekend, we'll talk about how badly they played. But after an impressive win, we'll talk about how brilliantly we played. It's this idea of how we want to uh, act in ways that allow us to feel uh, that we are seen positively um, by others. This idea of a, of a self-commitment. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, Adam Grant, who's a professor here at Wharton, uh, published an interesting set of studies uh, just a, a couple of years ago. How do you arrange and persuade doctors, physicians, to uh, sanitize their hands, to wash their hands each time that they go onto a hospital ward or each time they go into a treatment room or each time they treat an individual patient. They tested three different messages. The first was a simple gel in, wash out. An information appeal had no effect whatsoever at increasing this uh, practice of hand sanitization. So they tried a second message, and it was to say, it's important that you wash your hands because it keeps you sanitized, it keeps you healthy. You do it for the benefit of you. No effect whatsoever. It was the third message, the message that said, please wash your hands, please sanitize your hands for the sake of your patients. It was this idea that they were almost being reminded of the commitment that they had made when they qualified as medical practitioners. Yeah. So what small changes could we key into there that might lead to big differences? Well, take a look at this. This is a really interesting set of uh, research that looks at the simple act of including someone's photograph on their x-rays and their CT scans. Now imagine you're a diagnosing doctor, you see lots of plates, lots of CT scans, lots of x-rays, um, and your, your job is to diagnose them and make a recommendation. The small change here was to simply include a photograph of that patient on their x-ray plate to humanize the situation and the context. And in that instance, a significant increase in the amount of treatment options and rated caring that those physicians employed and applied to those x-ray plates. So one way that we can increase people's likelihood to be seen in a positive light is to do things that humanize interactions and remind them of their commitments. Okay? Here's another. You'll uh, probably recognize from the accent. I'm not from these parts. I'm from uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, the UK National Health Service has a significant problem with the number of people that will make appointments to go to see a physician, a physiotherapist, a dentist, and fail to show up. Okay? We have a system that is free at the point of delivery as well. So there are no penalties or costs incurred if patients fail to turn up. All the expense, all the cost, all those wasted resources is borne by the national health system. It costs literally hundreds of millions of pounds each and every year. 800 million pounds at the last estimate. How might we use one of these core motivations to change the way that an interaction takes place that increases the likelihood that, that people will show up? Well, here's one change that we actually made. When people phoned for an appointment, rather than the receptionist simply put the phone down after that patient had been given the time and day of their appointment, they would pause and ask simply that individual to repeat back verbally the time and day of the appointment. Your appointment's at uh, Tuesday next at 2.30. Could you just confirm that for me, please? Wait for the patient to confirm it. And we registered a modest but still significant reduction, 3.5% reduction. But a 3.5% reduction of an 800 million pound problem, that's like a $1.3 billion problem, is still significant. We then actually tested another insight, which made the commitment even more active. How many of you, when you've been given an appointment at a doctor's or a dentist or a physiotherapist, have ever been given a little card with the time and day of the appointment? Most of you in the room have been given that. Okay? Who writes the details on the card? 
Yeah, yeah, it's the receptionist, it's the, the health clerk, the person who is making the appointment for you. Turns out that there is very good evidence that that is the wrong person. Okay? When we simply arranged for the blank card and the pen to be given to the individual, we now register a very impressive reduction, close to 18% reduction in no-shows. Now an 18% reduction in a $1.3 billion problem, that's a huge impact for such a small change. So what I sought to have done this afternoon in our short time together is to offer you uh, an additional way to think about influence and persuasion beyond the traditional information, education, and economic levers that we typically rely on to persuade others. And that's to align your request to uh, just a set of very small but deeply rooted motivations that we all have and that we all deem as important the importance and the motivation to make rapid, efficient decisions in a crazy information overloaded world, the motivation to make those decisions in a way that align and affiliate and gain the approval of others, and to make those decisions in a way that allow us to be seen publicly in a positive light. And notice a couple of things about these small changes. First, that they often require just a change in context, not necessarily a change in cognition or a shift in the fundamental strategy or persuasion appeal that you're making of someone. We're not necessarily asking you to change what you have, change what you offer, change what you're proposing, just change the context in which it's seen. That's the first. The second, notice how small these changes are. Rarely, this is a surprising aspect of this recent and growing body of persuasion research, is that rarely do they require costly investments in time, in money, and additional resources. And finally, notice that rarely do these insights come about by an investigation of the best practices within an organization. And the best evidence I can give for that is the data from the tax offices. You know, tax officials have been collecting your money, our money, for centuries. You would have thought that they would have figured out the most effective ways to do it. They've figured out the best practices, and you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of sharing best practice, but remember also that best practices do have a limitation, and the limitation being that they'll typically only uncover those best practices that are and insights that are already known. It took a team of persuasion scientists to figure out that there was a more effective way as well. So uh, I wonder how we're doing for time. We've just got maybe a, a couple of moments. So I just did want to just finish off with this, um, this question here. Um, this idea of will these effects work in combination and will they work in any context or are there limitations to them? And I, I think that uh, there are limitations to them. So I don't want to present a panacea here that this is the way to influence and persuade people every time, uh, but rather just offer a set of, of, of universal principles and rules that will guide you uh, to a more effective uh, outcome. Um, but let me just talk briefly about a couple of these um, recent studies that we uh, cite in the book. The first is a good friend of mine, Paul Dolan, who's a behavioral economist at uh, the London School of Economics, ran a really interesting set of experiments uh, recently, found that if you send a letter to homeowners telling them that they are consuming more energy than their neighbors uh, with a request to reduce their energy consumption, that's a pretty effective way of actually getting people to reduce their energy consumption. You use that peer pressure. And in Paul's studies, he typically found that there was about a 6% reduction in energy consumption the following month. Um, he also found, interestingly, that uh, if you send a letter to people and say, please reduce your energy consumption, and if you do, we'll give you $150, that that was pretty effective as well, uh, typically reducing energy consumption by about the same amount. So the question, of course, is what if we combine those two things? What if we send a letter to people that says, uh, please reduce your energy consumption and fall in line with your neighbors, and if you do, we'll pay you $150? It turns out that when Paul did that in his studies, people had a heating party. <laughs> now, in mathematics, 1 plus 1 equals 2. Yeah? In persuasion science, that's not always the case. 
Um, so, you know, I can't report that simply adding more persuasion tactics to an appeal will actually lead to be more effective. Oftentimes, it doesn't. It actually reduces its effect, much in the same way as if you pour all the spice from your spice racks into the chicken. No one is going to want to eat it. I think it's the same when it comes to persuasion as well. Um, here's another example. Uh, back to our friend Adam Grant from Wharton. Uh, series of studies looking at charitable fundraising appeals. Um, he found that, again, a similar approach when people were sent a letter saying, uh, please donate to this charity, and there was a, an appeal that targeted their ego. Think about what others will be saying about you um, if you do donate. Okay, that was a pretty effective appeal. They raised donations as a result. A second group got a different letter, a more altruistic approach. Think, you know, the benefit that you'll do to others by donating, that was pretty effective as well. And he found the same thing when he combined the two approaches, put that egotistical and altruistic effects together, and it cancelled out the effect. Um, so the key message here is to um, use these insights sparingly. They are small, they fly under the radar. And what we're finding is, is that if we try and incorporate too many, uh, we do build resistance. One final one, and I think this speaks to the environment that we're here in in Google as well, is this idea of, well, do they work equally effectively in different contexts, for example, online? Um, this is a series of studies that we uh, conducted with our friends at Blue State Digital. Uh, again, fundraising, we send out emails to people uh, asking them to donate to a particular charity um, and test different messages. And one of the messages we wanted to test was this idea of um, to gain the approval and to affiliate with others. So pointing out how previous people like them had donated to the appeal. And we sent those out by email and found it had no effect whatsoever. No effect at all. Um, and we think what's going on here is that oftentimes that uh, more bloodless uh, communication, that email, um, wasn't serving to humanize that communication as much. It turned out that the best message in an email environment was to simply tell people how easy it was to donate. It only takes a minute. And that seems to be uh, the best message for that context, for that communication channel. And that's where we get this significant increase as well. So um, leave you with the thought that oftentimes these small changes, we also need to think about the appropriate context in which they can be used as well. Um, but the fact of the matter is that they are all small. And it turns out that when it comes to influencing and persuading others, I think we're gathering more and more evidence that small can very much be the new big. Thank you. Um, to tell a little story there that we, um, I don't know if people here are, are with PG&E. Um, we are at home and we get these letters that say how our neighbors are doing. And certainly that was like almost like a game for us then to, we were way over our neighbors. <laughs> Um, and so I felt really bad, and so then we, yeah, uh, I think, we adjusted. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the case that, that the U.S., through, um, through the OPAR organization, uh, um, have uh, made great strides in that, in, that, in that field, those home energy reports. Yeah. So I'm curious if you could hazard a guess as to a couple of generations down the road. We learn a couple of sort of small changes that we can make. Do you think as generations progress, we become, as a group, become more immune to things, so then this, uh, these kinds of studies would have to be repeated? Or is it in, in, intrinsic in our nature somehow? Yeah, that's a great question. The desensitization um, as a... Yeah, as, as, as we learn more about the influence process and learn more about the strategies that do effectively influence and persuade others, do we become less uh, affected by them and perhaps sense, uh, desensitized to them? Um, so I want to say two things about that. I, I think the first thing to recognize is that um, it's not just our knowledge of the influence and persuasion process that uh, extends and grows over time. Our knowledge of all information extends and grows as well. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not that we are growing in um, uh, our insights about one particular field to the expense of others. So we're we are constantly being overloaded. So our, uh, our need to have quick and efficient mechanisms for making decisions um, won't wane. If anything, it will actually increase. 
But I think there is a case to be made when it comes to the particular tactic or individual strategy that someone uses. I'll give you an example. Um, so it turns out that uh, if you've ever been given a mint or a chocolate at the end of your meal when the, when the food server brings the receipt and the bill along for you, um, despite people saying that they are immune to such effects, it does, there's one that you've got, <laughs> it does influence uh, uh, tipping behavior. So if a, a food server puts down one mint for each person at the table along with the bill, uh, tips typically increase in, in these studies that David Stromitz conducted by around about 3%. Um, interesting, if they put two mints down on the table, uh, they don't double, they actually quadruple. You get about a 14% increase. Um, so there's a really good example of us responding to uh, an obligation. Someone's given that to us first. Now, if every single restaurant did that, we would very, very quickly become desensitized to that particular tactic. Okay? And therefore, I think it would wane, it would decrease in effectiveness pretty rapidly. But the fundamental motive that drives that behavior, our desire to give back to others what has been given to us first and to live up to our obligations, that doesn't wane at all. So I think the answer to your question is uh, that the individual strategies and tactics themselves could become less effective over time but the fundamental set of principles that shape and guide influence and persuasion uh, will increase in value as we become more information overloaded, more stimulus saturated, and, and require these um, shortcuts to good decisions. You mentioned that context is more, uh, more powerful than information or economic reasons. And in delivering this message to us or persuade us, this uh, can you use you know, context instead? in addition to all the information you've given give out as an example to us? Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. I'm, you know, I, now, I'm not saying that information and education and you know, incentives aren't important. They are, they are very, very important. But consider them, yeah, consider them like this. Consider them like two legs of a stool. Um, Two-legged stools are often wobbly. Um, what this set of research presents and offers is, is, a, is a third stabilizing leg, a, a third lever. Um, and you know, this thing about, info, uh, about information, it's great that we have access to just so much information, easily accessible at the click of a button, the swipe of a screen. You know, you are, as an organization, the world's curators when it comes to information. And I think that's an actual wonderful thing. But remember, too, that we are just overwhelmed with information. We, you know, it's, just simply pouring more information into you know, uh, an appeal is much like pouring more water into an already full pail of water. It will just spill out over the side. And so it's, it's not information that influences us. It's information in the right context that aligns to one of these core motivations. That, I think, is the key to successful persuasion. It provides that additional set of tools um, in that regard. Do you have any more examples of some interesting situations where, like, A-B testing um, might be effective, if, you know, specifically in our marketing and our advertising at Google, where an A-B test, the presentation might make the difference between the sale of, you know, the, the purchase of an ad space versus not or something like that? Yeah, I, I do. And, you know, I, I think you're just in a, a wonderful position to be able to do that. Uh, with the facilities you actually have to, to craft an appeal and just make a small subtle change to maybe the position of an image on a website or the inclusion of a, a social proof appeal or the um, change in, in words. I mean, that's essentially what we did with those uh, charitable uh, studies. Uh, you know, we randomize uh, three different audiences to receive a different message. Um, took 10% of the total audience that were going to receive these uh, emails, um, figured out which one was the most effective so that we can then load all the ballast onto, onto the 90% that haven't yet received the email. They, you know, I'm a huge fan of this idea of test and learn. And one of the things that new technologies give us now is the ability to do that very quickly, very simply, often very, very cheaply. You know, um, you know big Electronics fan of is cheap. 
Sorry? Electronics is cheap. It is Electronics paper. Is it, does, cheap. it doesn't live forever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're in this position now where we can test and learn a lot more effectively. Um, do so on a small scale, uh, but a big enough scale to recognize there's some robustness to what we're actually doing. And then we can, as I say, load our resources on, on that message or that appeal that we know is tested the best. You provided a number of examples that about, about big things that were done or, or um, affecting a lot of people. Uh, taxpayers, uh, guests in, in hotels. Do you have examples of things that you've done for one-on-one -on -one interactions with other people where this comes into play? Yeah, um, yeah, let me give you a couple of those because, yeah, I, th I think, you know, when we're talking about these big data sets, you know, large numbers of homogenous transactions allow us to be able to present a compelling case in terms of the robustness. But oftentimes our influence appeals are simply down to a one-to-one -to -one uh, interaction with a colleague or a, or a manager. So um, let, me, let me give you a couple. Um, there, there's one that actually we talk about in the book, uh, a series of studies that conducted by uh, uh, Terry Kritzberg from Rutgers University over in, in New Jersey, who finds that when we are looking to build a relationship with someone who is remote to us, a colleague perhaps in a, in a, in a different city or even in a different region of the world, Something we can do very, very early on in our email exchanges to humanize that interaction um, is to place uh, an attachment uh, such as a small cartoon. Um, so she conducted this with one-to-one uh, -one negotiations in organizations and found that uh, when the individual concerned reached out to a negotiating partner in their organization um, and in this instance, actually attached a Dilbert cartoon where Dilbert actually screws up a negotiation. That was the kind of icebreaker. Um, so in, in the, an increasingly uh, electronic world that we actually live in, you know, th these small steps that just humanize an interaction can be um, important things um, that make the difference um, to, to everyone else that's doing the quick, efficient email thing. So there's, there's, there's an immediate example in a one-to-one -one situation reaching out to colleagues. So that's an example of changing the context. Yes, changing I think so. Yeah, yeah. It gives a sense of there's someone on the other side, not just perhaps a faceless email address. It humanizes that interaction. How can you guard against this uh, techniques being used on you? Because sometimes, I mean, this techniques can be used in a good way and also in a bad way. So is it like uh, uh, just by knowing this techniques itself, is it enough to guard against them? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, in fact, and there's an inherent message underneath that as well, which is that, you know, uh, some of these effects can be used to exploit, to manipulate, to, uh, you know, get people perhaps to make decisions that they wouldn't ordinarily make if they had all the facts or all the information to actually hand. So there's a very important ethical message here that, you know, one would hope that you'd only use these in a, in a morally responsible and ethical way. Um, I think that understanding these biases, understanding how they do affect and influence us can help. Um, so, you know, one could make the argument that any book about influence and persuasion or any set of information about the influence and persuasion process is not only a set of tools to influence and persuade others, but arguably could be used as a defense strategy as well. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that knowing these effects is going to be enough. And, and the primary reason for that is that we just don't have oftentimes the space to think about whether they are being used on us. And, and particularly these, these small changes that are so small that they often fly under the radar. You know, there's, there's very good evidence from the persuasion sciences, science, sciences and, and behavioral sciences more generally that people aren't that good at recognizing what it is in a context that does influence and persuade them. There's a really great set of studies uh, that were conducted here in California um, when researchers went door to door asking homeowners which message would most motivate them to reduce their energy consumption, perhaps be a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, they rated um, information about how if they changed their behavior it would be beneficial to society as the biggest motivation followed by uh, the impact it would have on future generations, followed by the savings that they actually make. They dismissed the idea that because their neighbors were increasingly making these changes that it would have any influence. But then in the tests, when those messages were distributed across the neighbors, 
the neighborhoods rather, uh, that message of social proof was the only message that had an effect. So it's a really good demonstration of um, much as it might not be comforting to learn, um, we often aren't that good at recognizing what does influence and persuade us. So I'm not entirely convinced that just learning about them will be enough, but I think it's a good step. More and more I think about it, my takeaway is that you don't really know what is actually going to work. Um, and it's, you know, it depends on the context, depends on the people, the same message may not work uh, in a different crowd. So if you just had one chance, then almost you could try, but you don't know what the effect is going to be. But if you were able to do some testing and so on and try different options, then you have a possibility, you know, like the A-B testing, where you could do 1%, 2%, and then go for a larger message. But like the presentations and so on, you have a one shot where you're talking to a VP and saying, hey, here is the thing. You could deploy the strategy which you talked about, hey, use two of these. You don't really know what the effect is going to be ultimately. Well, I, I do accept that to a certain point. However, um, I, I do think that there is a huge advantage to understanding the fundamental principles compared to perhaps just going with gut feeling. Yeah? And you know, if, if we know that we can increase the appeal, the effectiveness of our proposition by aligning it to one or more of these core motivations, and that we will be in a better position than not, that alone has got to be of huge value. Um, compared to sitting at our desks with you know, the, 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 the spreadsheet in front of us, the, the slideshow, whatever it may be, thinking about, well, what do I think will influence this VP? Um, there's, a, there's a set of tools grounded in good evidence that will increase potentially the likelihood that we will be successful. I'm never going to say, and, I, and, and any, any person that comes into Google and says that they found the way to persuade 100% of the people 100% of the time, you want to kick them out the door because it doesn't exist. But we can, by making these small changes, measure bigger effects in our persuasive success. There's no doubt about that. I've got a question on just more personal as far as you writing this book. What was your process involved in like, finding time for yourself to get this done? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and there's three of us, by the way, as well. It's, it's not just my book. Uh, uh, Noah Goldstein and Robert Cialdini have also contributed equally. Um, so one thing that has helped is the fact that we've structured this book slightly differently uh, to a traditional book, which would have maybe a core idea and then eight or nine chapters that it expands on. This book is made up of actually 53 chapters. Um, and each chapter is no more than 1,500 words long. Um, you know, so uh, it presents an insight from persuasion science. It gives you enough of the underlying mechanism to uh, get in touch with what's actually going on. And then it rapidly moves to a, here's what it means to you at work, at home, whatever the situation may be. And, write, and, and so writing them in that way I think uh, was a good exercise because we could write them as perhaps blog posts to begin with, you know, five or six hundred word blog posts, uh, scan the latest research, uh, read the abstracts in the journals, uh, pick those that we think have a good uh, basis of, of application, uh, and then extend those chapters. So we can, we can write them um, at different times, and we don't necessarily have to write them, uh, you know, sequentially one after the other. We can, you know, write them as the as the as the as the data becomes available, um, and then think about the application. So that's that's one of the approaches we actually made, and and that made the job a a, a lot easier. Um, of course, the challenge then is is that when you've got lots and lots of content, is how you actually organise it. Um, and that's where this idea of these three core motivations came in—that we could generally categorise them. Um, and that's the approach we actually took. And um, the, I think the, the final thing which was useful was the fact that, um, so I'm not an academic by training. My two colleagues clearly are. And so to have that balance of um, scientifically and academically informed insight, but then a reality check that said, okay, well, that's all very well in theory, but how do you apply it in practice? What does that mean to you know, people in Google, people in organizations that need to interact each and every day? How do we operationalize this? I think that was also an important aspect of the, of the creation process too.
Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, all right, let's thank you.